All right, so we're back with my uncle's escaped Alcatraz with Ken Weiner, Weidner and Mike Lynch, and we have a special guest today, Michael Street. And Michael had done some work on some of the photographs or the photograph that everyone talks about in regards to whether or not uh, John and Clarence made it out alive and if they made it to Brazil. And uh, so we, you know, he had done some work for, I believe it was the, it was the history channel show or the discovery history channel. Channel. Uh, And so we wanted to have him on Um, Ken and Mike have never met him just kind of the, the email exchanges and, and stuff like that. So we, we wanted to have him on to kind of talk about what he does and how he, you know, his process and how he, you know, analyzes these photographs and, he also is a, a retired um, law enforcement officer as well, so he has a legal background for that. So, Michael, thank you for being on with us. And so why don't you start off by kind of telling our listeners what it is that you do and how you do it. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's great to talk about uh, what I do in, in this particular case, which you know has fascinated you know, generations of true crime and Alcatraz buffs. But uh, how I got into this was you know, my primary career was that of being a police officer. I started in the police department back in the late 70s, and I retired as a sergeant in 2008 uh, from a police department in Central Orange County, California, near Disneyland. And throughout my career, I was a detective, a field training officer, worked a variety of different assignments, gangs, street detective, uh, crimes against persons, worked on the homicide investigation team. And along the way, when I first started becoming a police officer, my first thought was basically, my best way of serving my community and making sure it was safe was locking as many people up as possible, as long as, of course, they were the right people. So I was always looking for something uh, that would be a good tool for me to use. And I was a lifelong artist. My original career goal was to be a Disney animator. I wanted to make movies and do cartoons and make people happy and put a smile on their face. And um, I guess in a way, I, I put smiles on people's faces were the victims of crimes when we did the sketches and you know, locked somebody up. Uh, but uh, I didn't really know I wanted to do that. I, I, my father was a, a career police officer, retired uh, after 35 years as a police chief. And I always had cops around my house and, and a police presence. And I listened to their stories. And police officers are typically, they're either considered big BSers or great storytellers. And I just was amazed at the stories they would tell. Not so much of the heroics, because a, a lot of the people I was exposed to were pretty humble. Uh, but just the day-to-day uh interactions they had with people to made it a less monotonous career than sitting, sitting behind a desk somewhere. I thought, I'm outside all day, I'm first there on the scene of the action, and it would never be boring. I mean, it was something that appealed to me. So I got into it after high school, put my art career on the shelf, and one night I was getting ready for work, and I saw a police composite sketch flash across the screen on ABC7 Eyewitness News, which is based here in Los Angeles. And it was a composite sketch by LAPD's police sketch artist. And I, at that moment, I had that epiphany, it was that aha moment where I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's how I can merge my art career, my, my love of public service. So I got on the phone the next day and started calling uh, LAPD, got a hold of sketch artist. Uh, coincidentally, he was having an upcoming training class. I took that training class. We became friends. He became a mentor and a, and a good friend of mine, uh, who I still keep in touch with to this day, over 40 years later. And it started to fire me. The more I learn the less I knew and the more I wanted to learn. So I traveled all over the country at that time, studying under the best people that I knew of in in, in law enforcement. And I learned how to do facial reconstructions. I learned how to do different types of composites, some photo editing along the way. And it seemed like every time there was something new to learn about facial identification, uh, I got into it. Went to the the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and how to do age progressions of long-term missing children. Uh, when it came uh, part of uh, you know, things started going digital, I, I learned how to draw digitally and, and uh, from pencils and paper to uh, pixels and screens and pen styluses. And there was just so much to learn in my journey. And, and every time, uh, for example, um, I heard about this one-to-one facial comparison and analysis field that was out there, and I wanted to train in that, so I went to several training courses in that. Because it seemed like if I would get a request from somebody and I couldn't do it, I'd figure out a way to do it. And all it did was expand my repertoire of how I could both serve law enforcement 
And as it turned out, you know, serving private individuals in the entertainment industry, I'm a regular sketch artist, do a lot of props for Bosch, the television show. I've done that for like the last three seasons. I made an appearance on Lincoln Lawyer. So I get to do some fun stuff as well. And uh, when I retired as a police officer, police sergeant, I should say, um, I knew I didn't want to go. I, I still have a lot of life left in me and, and a lot of, to offer. So I started my own consultant business and that grew to having a global presence. Uh, I was invited to Ghana in 2018 to speak about forensic art and forensic facial imaging at one of their forensic universities there. I have a, I've lectured all over the world via webinar, thanks to Zoom. And it's just been an amazing journey. So I have my own company now, Sketch Cop Solutions. We're a forensic facial identification consultancy firm. We developed a composite sketching software for agencies that don't have access to a qualified police sketch artist. Uh, we offer training, consultancy, again, to both the public sector through law enforcement and the private industry, collectors, the entertainment industry, uh, private investigators, uh, people who don't feel like they're being serviced properly by the police department. If they don't have a resource or they want a sketch done, then they hire me sometimes working in concert with the police department that's investigating their case to make sure they have all the resources available. And most recently, uh, you know, as far as a career goes, in 2011, it sounds like a long time, it doesn't sound so recent, but it still seems fresh to me. I was selected by Baltimore Police Department to be their first ever full-time forensic sketch artist, which meant I left my family in California and uh, did a boots on the ground assignment there in Baltimore. Uh, serving one of the most violent cities in America. And I had the highest caseload of, of any forensic artists in the country at that time. And I still serve them via Zoom remotely uh, today, like most agencies I service. And it's just been a tremendous journey that I don't see any um, end to. And, and of course, what got me involved with Ken uh, was the Escape from Alcatraz show that was broadcast in 2015 on the History Channel when they presented this photograph to me to have me take a look at. And again, with all the training I'd recently finished in one-to-one -one photo analysis, it was a great first assignment to have. And it was a very, very interesting case that that lives on today because they keep replaying. I keep getting Facebook messages. I was playing on TV last night on the History Channel. Wow, you know, yeah. people are fascinated by this case. I'm still fascinated by this case. Who what happened be? to these guys? Exactly. Who wouldn't be? I wanted to stop you real quick. I just wanted to ask you just kind of because what you've kind of laid out there is, you, you know, obviously you started out in law enforcement and then you got into police uh, sketch artists and stuff like that. So and you've been doing it for a while. So I just wanted to ask you, how, what have you seen as far as the progression, as far as how you can identify these photos as when, you know, or suspects and police sketch? How far has it come since the time that you started when you basically you know, went to that, that mentor of yours and took that class? You know, back then, again, I've been doing this since 1980, so it's been coming up on 45 years. And in that four decades, a lot's happened. In particular, I think the thing that's most, the two technologies that have impacted our field the most have been forensic genetic genealogy with DNA and also CCTV cameras and the proliferation of cameras, people with their smartphones and such. So there is so much information available these days and there's been such a lack of confidence by police investigators and prosecutors and eyewitness identification uh, that police composites have kind of gone from like up here, one of the first things they call, to one of the last things they call, if they even call at all. Um, mm -hmm. And, and as, as much as they feel eyewitnesses get it wrong, most of them get it right. And it's like anything else, if you're trained properly, you're going to do the job better than most and, and minimize those opportunities for the wrongly convicted. Absolutely. All right. So take us into <laughs> how you got contacted uh, to be on the uh, History Channel show and and what, what kind of work you did for them. Okay. Well, I was in 2015, I was contacted by Texas Crew Production, a company out of Austin, Texas, and they were doing a show for the History Channel on the escape from Alcatraz. Now, I, 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 don't, I think everybody in my generation probably heard of Alcatraz and everyone has the same question, did they make it off the island? So there's a movie made about it with Clint Eastwood and, and it's been a part of you know American culture for so many decades that when they asked me to take a look at this photograph, I, I jumped at the chance. Again, it was a 
in case it had a law enforcement angle to it, an investigative angle. And I liked the way they approached it because they just wanted me to look at the picture, see what I thought in terms of if it could be uh, the Anglin brothers uh, and what my thoughts were on it uh, because it was an integral part of this, this series that they were filming. So how did you break down that photograph and how did you attack that photograph to kind of... Well, it's really interesting. Because, yeah, the, the, the photograph itself was, um, it was an older photograph. It was probably better than most of the photographs I get because a lot of the photographs I get, if they're not law enforcement based, they're collector based and they're tin types and they're older type of uh, photography technology. This So this one being rather recent, there was still some clarity to it. Um, there was some blurriness to it. There was some detail in the areas I needed it. But most of all, you had a couple of guys here wearing large sunglasses, some facial hair, some overgrown hair, which you know grew over the years, which is an important identifier when it comes to facial comparison. Um, so my approach to it was to take a look at it, you know, do some reading up on, on the brothers, try to learn a little bit about their background, because while I heard of the case, I didn't know a lot of the, about the mechanics of the players involved. Um, the unique thing about this, now it wasn't my job to determine the provenance of the photo or the validity of the photo, if it was a, if it was a doctored photo. Mine was to basically look at the photo and try to identify the people in it. The one thing that um, I found you know, before going into the, the process was that these brothers while incarcerated, always seemed to get incarcerated in the same prison and always seemed to be together. So without being, without that creating a bias, you know, it did seem odd people who are trying to refute the photo. What would the likelihood of these two guys showing up in the, in the same picture allegedly in Brazil? So when I look at these photos, I, I try to get photos that are in the same angle. And luckily there were a lot of booking photos uh, some candid shots. Uh, I think uh, one of the brothers, the, there was a photo taken on the steps outside the courthouse, so the facial angle was tilted in a fashion similar to the photograph in question. Um, I had some technology where I was able to rotate uh, the other. Um, now, I, I don't remember who's who, so I'll tell you, the, the darker-haired brother. That would be Clarence. That would be Clarence? That would be Clarence. Clarence. Mm -hmm. Clarence. Okay. So I was able to tilt his face and rotate his face similar to the one in the photo. And then after I had all those lined up and cropped to a similar size, then I went and did a uh, top-down uh, analysis of the face from you know the top of the head down to the chin. I looked at the uh, cheekbones, uh, if there were anything, uh, if there was any detail left in the ear. Because again, the ears, the ears are pretty much uh, a pretty stable structure, like a fingerprint, it's going to stay very similar. Uh, through time, and it's a very unique. It has very unique traits that are that are identifiable. And um, I, I think that there was a, there was enough detail there in terms of the similarity in shapes. I think that um, so it just basically just hopscotching around the face, looking at the photo. I'm sorry, looking at the facial features. It had enough detail for me to discern, make some sort of professional opinion. But at the same time, you know, when you look at photographs, it's something that's very subjective. No two people are going to look at them and see the same thing. Whereas we may see, believe it's somebody, somebody else is going to come along and say, not. So in this case, I was able to determine that after my analysis, that it was my professional opinion, my belief that it was highly likely that that picture depicted the Anglin brothers that in fact they were um, likely or highly likely was still they were they survived the escape or still alive or yeah were alive at the time of the photo for some of the other photos you were using as comparison how many did you actually use to kind of get you, get you that that sampling uh you know at least no more than six i i would say i would say four minimum six maximum there were a lot of pictures of them i mean again they had a you know they they'd been arrested several times and uh and there were a couple newspaper photos. And so there were plenty of photos for me to make a, a subjective, I'm sorry, an objective, subjective evaluation and come to some sort of professional opinion. Mm -hmm. And Ken, you were, the, 
obviously there when you heard this information, correct? Well, I, I wasn't in the room when Art and Michael were looking at photos. Uh, I, I believe uh, Art is the one who was sitting with Michael when he was analyzing or giving his results uh, when they filmed it. Uh, I actually didn't see the end result until pretty much everybody else did when the show aired. Uh, they they kind of kept it from us. So. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about it since I, now I know how it was kind of set up that you were set up with Art, the uh, former U.S. Marshal. And was he retired at that point or was he still in the Marshals? I can't remember, 2015. Uh, Art, he, I think he was retired. Yeah, he, he, I, I believe he was about to retire from the uh, Homeland Security. He, he had moved over into Homeland Security, mm-hmm. and I believe he was just on the verge of retiring uh, from that so, position. So, Mike, talk us through what that was like and when you, I mean, obviously some of the stuff, I'm sure you guys had conversations off camera beforehand, and, uh, you know, uh, just kind of talk us through what it was like kind of going through that with uh, – Art, the uh, retired U.S. Marshal. Sure. Yeah, what had happened was, is I was submitted via email the pictures, and then I went ahead and, and created the display panels, and as well as filed a, uh, a formal report on my findings and, and what I based my findings on. Then I, I returned that to, to Texas Crew since they were the client, and then they had me. Um, they they arranged for my travel to Austin to film my segment alongside Art, and I went ahead and, and went through the whole process with him and showed him on screen what I was seeing and what led me to believe that it was highly likely that these were brothers. And off camera, uh, there were, I wouldn't say there was a lot of pressure, but there was some, you know, some trying to get me to say that that was for sure <laughs> brothers. And I, and I said, well, you know, I don't think that this is one of the things I, I caution all clients, whether they're public or, or private collectors, I said, you know, unless somebody jumps out of that photo and says, hey, it's me, or there's some sort of DNA or some sort of hard evidence that proves it's them, you can't look at a picture and say, for sure it was them. Right. All I told them was quite famously, um, if it were me, I'd round up the posse. <laughs> I love that. That was, close. that was as close <laughs> I would get them to say, if I was a detective, I'd round up the posse based on what you just told me. Yeah. And so they did. So can I ask Michael a question? Yeah, help yourself. So, so Michael, as a professional law enforcement that has done this before, if, if you were trying to identify two people in a photo and you're trying to see if this, this is the same person, is facial recognition pretty much the standard tool that you would use? Or are there other tools that you could use to aid in that that comparison? Well, you could use you could use a facial recognition software program of some sort. Um, you'd have to um, you'd have to enter the the you'd have to enter your um, known photos, mm-hmm. you know, photos that have been verified and, and widely recognized to be that person, and then of course you'd have to put your question photo in there. And the al- and let the algorithm do its work. Now, there are different algorithms on these different facial recognition software titles, and there are a lot of them out there. You know, some of them um, are based upon you know interpupillary distance. Some are based upon highlights and shadows and, and such. And um, so, no two algorithms are going to rate them the same if they rate them at all, if they recognize the photos. Like say, for example, um, you put a bunch of pictures of Clarence angling in there that's known to be Clarence. And you put a bunch of pictures of, of uh, John in there that, 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 that known to be him. And then you put the question one in there. One program may rate it at 87%. One may do it at like 78. One other may do it at 92%. But you can set the threshold at what you want these um, facial recognition systems to recognize a photo and makes the matches and such. I don't use that. I use a, a system that was taught by the FBI and, and another um, defense contractor, you know, you know, whose people look at these terrorists from drone shots and different intelligence sources. So I use, I use this morphological method where I just take two um, photos and I look at each 
facial part and uh, look at its form, look at its shape, keeping in mind the, the time they were taking, what aging does to the face, and, um, and make my determination from there. So, so what you said, which I agree, you know, is that you're using software uh, to do this. Is it possible for a law enforcement individual to take two photos, lay them on a desk, take a ruler, regular standard you know, ruler, and measure, say, the height of both people and determine whether or not that's the same person? Is, is, that, no. is that a valid way of doing it? No, 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 it's not because... You don't know what lens was used on that camera. You don't know the exposure, the, the angle, how far away that the picture was taken. And um, while there is some software that will that has tools to compensate for that. Um, but you could do it just, manually. I mean, it's almost kind of impossible. Like for instance, I couldn't take a I couldn't take a ruler and say measure, I've got two photos of Clarence, the one that was from 70s in Brazil, and one that I have that him standing up against a wall at a prison, I couldn't measure his elbow down to his wrist and then do the same thing on the other photo and say, well, it's not the same, so it can't be him. I mean, that wouldn't be a legit like no, me. it wouldn't be because you've got no, okay. no you got but you got you've got no sense of scale right. and nothing to measure against. I mean right. like it's it's like when you see a crime scene photo, you always see this 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 thumb and forefinger holding a ruler in the lower corner in the screen and and because there has to be some sort of sense of scale because otherwise, um, you know, no two pictures taken the same and you've got no scale, you've got no information on the camera, the aperture or anything. So it's, it's really a useless endeavor to, to try to do that. And it's not recommended, nor is it recognized. Can, can you use characteristics? Let's say like, for instance, uh, in every photo that we have of Clarence, let's use Clarence for an example. Clarence always carried his cigarettes. He was a smoker and he carried it in his uh, in his pocket. If that photo that we're talking about throughout the facial recognition, Clarence had, or this individual in this photo had cigarettes in the same pocket. Or let's say like there is um, the way he would hold his hand, you know, like from his index to his thumb, you know, was the exact same kind of way as he's just standing casually. I mean, can you use those type pieces to say, hey, well, this person looks very similar because he's has the same characteristic? You, you can make that inference. I mean, okay. look, when with, with facial recognition, facial comparison, just like the same thing with stature and gait analysis, all it does is it gives you probable cause to, like in, a, in police, the, the law enforcement world, it gives you probable cause to do further investigation upon that person. Say, for example, there was a picture of somebody um, that you put out there and, and he's a wanted fugitive and he's going by a different name and, and he holds a cigarette, he, he walks very similarly. Law enforcement is going to approach that as, okay, it, it could be him, it may not be him, but we're going to have to go maybe do some surveillance, maybe collect some DNA surreptitiously. It's not, it's again, because it's, there's nothing in a photograph outside of somebody holding up their driver's license or something to prove it's them to really say it's them. So it's really an investigative tool to give someone more cause. Like for an example, with this case, all my analysis did was give the U.S. Marshals or whoever else a reason to go down to South America to look and investigate and see if in fact they could identify them, and if they were dead, identify their grave and exhume them and, and do a DNA check and stuff like that. Do, now, do you know? If, do you know if they ever went to Brazil? The U.S. I don't know. After you get after, yeah, after I came home from Austin, that was the last I I heard about um, the case in terms of what progress has been made or what's been done on the case. Other than through talking to you, that's it. Okay, Mike. Hey, Mike Lynch. Why don't you tell him a little bit about because I what I thought was really interesting, and it's kind of like we're the direction we're going to, the 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 way uh, John wore his watch and how we kind of analyzed it in two different photographs. Yeah, there was a, a photograph of John taken some years before Alcatraz where he wrote, wore a watch on his left, not on his wrist, but more on his forearm. 
which is a little unusual. You know, most people, when they wear a watch, it's, it's, it's on their wrist area. Of course, that's why they call it a wristwatch, not on the forearm. And then in the, in the Brazil photo, this person standing is wearing a wristwatch on his left forearm, just as John did. And then we have two photographs of the 75 photograph and the one that was taken some years earlier and the, and the wristwatch is in, essentially in the, in the same location. I mean, it's not absolute proof, of course. I'm sure there are a lot of people who wear it that way, but it does intersect with the person in the photograph that they would wear it in that unusual manner. And well, and, and again, if that's the case, then it would be up to the investigating law enforcement agency to determine if that was enough for them to do further investigation and commit the resources to. Because even though this is a and in a case that's of interest to the public at large, and it's a and it's a cultural crime, so to speak. In other words, it's it's, it's everyone's heard of it. So it's when they make movies about stuff, write books about things like this, it becomes a public interest, and it's still an open it's still an open investigation, to my knowledge, is what it should be. So it all depends on on how interested that law enforcement agency is in clearing the case and bringing some sort of resolution to it. So um, I think all those are good points. All, all those as they pile up, you know, whether it's a, a, fa a facial analysis or a, a, an object that's, that's very uncommon in the, in the way a person would wear, whether it's facial jewelry or wristwatch on their forearm or however they do it, you present those findings to, to law enforcement and it's going to be up to them to see how much, again, how much resources how much and how interested they are in clearing this case. Well, the, the thing that we have found interesting about this the Brazilian photograph is for both men standing there is the way that they stood, the manner like the wristwatch, you know, uh, Clarence being more dark haired, John being more blondish, you know, the, the, the cigarettes in Clarence's pocket. And then, of course, you know, the, the I know Clarence face wasn't as as open to interpretation because it's more covered than John's is. You know, his is always the stronger result. Um, even when we did the show with Expedition Unknown, when we had Ident TV, you know, do the same analysis you did with their technology, you know, their uh, connection to John was much stronger than it was to Clarence. But all the markers that that we can identify in the photograph when it comes to the two always intersect to John and Clarence. It's not it's not an absolute identification like you said. You can't say that's John and Clarence. You can't say that. But you can say it's as you said, it's highly likely because the markers are all pointing to them rather than oh, John wore his watch on the on his left wrist, but this guy has it on his right. So that's that's clearly a, a contradiction. There's not there's nothing in the photographs that contradict known information about the two which in my mind really makes a, a very compelling case that these are actually them. Because if, if uh, Fred Breezy took a photograph of two other people in this photo, the odds of them matching John and Clarence so closely are, you know, next to zero, I would think, that he either was trying to fake a photograph by using other people to forge the, the, the idea that it's them, or he just grab two guys and they just happen to be so closely aligned with John and Clarence that it seems more unlikely that it's not them than it is them. And, and look, there's, I, I get a lot of, again, crime pictures. I had a, a picture the other day, somebody sent me of a fugitive and I said, yeah, you know, it, 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 it resembles the person, but there are a couple differences here and largely was one of, of the, the clothing style and a hat that the person was wearing, that it was unlikely that that person would, if, if you've got like 50 pictures of the guy and he's wearing a similar style of clothing, all of a sudden you've got one picture of a person that resembles him. And, uh, you know, you go from uh, outdoorsman to someone who looks like a skater um, at that person's AGB now. I don't think it's very likely. Um, just like there was a picture somebody sent me of, um, of JFK President John F. Kennedy, um, when he got off a plane in Dallas before he's assassinated, they had a picture of someone in a crowd who they thought might be an assassin. They sent me mug shots and other media photos and such. And while it may resemble them, there just wasn't enough there. I mean, sometimes it's a minute detail or sometimes it's there's just something that's just out of place, but the rest of them resembles that person. 
And um, in this particular case, there was more going for it being them than there was not, regardless of how much the faces were covered with facial hair, uh, over large sun, overly large sunglasses, of course, which is the style back then. So, so I felt pretty confident. Um, so Michael, I think you, was, you, you looked at it in 2015, and, and we've, we've had a couple of other companies look at it throughout you know, the last five years. The last company was, as Mike said, Ident TV, which was in uh, 2022. Today's term, I mean, talking today, 2024, mm -hmm. uh, is the technology now almost, you know, with the with the help of AI, is it is it at the point that we could probably, if we had it re-examined, you know, what what new tool was out there and what do you think the uh, the chances of it even getting a close up match? Um, in my experience, what I know now is uh, you're looking at technology that would lead you to them and or if they passed away where they're buried and DNA or fingerprints or dental charts is the only thing that's going to give you a positive ID because again, you're working with a photo, you're, you're, you're working with something very subjective. So AI might be able to enhance the photo. It might be able to provide you with an age progression but the only thing that's going to lead you to them is good old fashioned detective work. And once you find them or you find their bodies, um, recognize positive ID analysis, again, DNA, uh, x-rays, uh, dental charts, you know, things like that, fingerprints, if there are any, then that's it. Gotcha. Do you, hey, Michael, do you know of, if AI is at that point, because I've seen some crazy things that AI has done with photographs and and enhancements and stuff. Do you think that they have the capacity to actually take off the facial hair and and de-age their skin based upon the the shape of their head and kind of almost kind of trans you know to kind of really be able to get underneath those layers like and also what. Uh, subtract like the sunglasses is that a, is, is that something that AI could possibly do to kind of enhance that photograph possibly possibly and because you know AI is doing nothing than than, than scraping the the internet for images that they use as um, resources and a learning tool it might find a picture of them with um, may find a picture of them on on the, on the net and, and replace their real eyes with that of the image of the sunglasses on. So I'm not quite sure how that would work. I've, I've used, I've been using and introducing AI into some of my work now because you just can't ignore it. Yeah. But you have to be really careful that you're not, you know, creating something that's not there. Uh, well, I think again, the thing with AI, it's all about how it's prompted too. It it's, is. Oh, very and, and, and cause we've, we've used it on some projects as well. And uh, so it's, it all it'll only evaluate the information you give it. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like we could look we could load in every photograph of Clarence and John into an AI program and along with that photograph and then ask it. All right. Does you know, does the do these two uh, people match up with the existing? Because what I find it's really interesting and what is because I've I've gone through. Ken and Mike have sent me all these photographs that they have in the book and some that have not been in the book that they've written. And the one thing after yeah. I started looking at them, then I started studying them. And then when we got to that, the point where we were really looking at that Brazil photograph, I started going back and looking at, they have a ton of pictures of those guys just standing next to each other, you know, just standing casually in a contrapposite pose, you know, we're just like kind of arms down just and stuff like that. And, and, there's so many similarities in their posture, their hand position, just the way they look at the camera. I mean, it's just, it's very, you know, it's, it's very provoking. And it's just like, and now that we, you know, and then Mike, like a few weeks back pointed out when they were talking about the wristwatch. And I, I try, I actually looked up photographs of people wearing their wristwatch that way. I couldn't find it. I had a hard time finding people, you know, I mean, the only thing is like, and, the, and I don't know why he did it that way, 
other than I know they both came, they were farmers. They grew up in a family farming. And that to me would be like a logical thing to do is to push your, because they work with their hands. They, they don't want their watch to get hurt or, you know, destroyed. And so they push it up towards their forearm. And, you know, cause I was looking at all these photographs and it just, it kind of, there was a lot of just from the naked eye and I'm not an expert at this, but just after you, you're looking at them long enough. And I've been looking at them, these photographs for a few months now, almost on a daily basis going when we, cause we put photographs into the, uh, the podcast as well. And also going through the book and, you know, we're doing a lot of some other projects with, with Ken and Mike and trying to get their, their, their story out there. So I was just curious if that is, if, if that is something that you can really, and cause I understand, you know, being in a filmmaker, I understand the concept of lenses can distort images lens, you know, you have forced perspective, you have, you know, like you said, you know, you, if you don't have something that give you scale and I found it really interesting that they had, he had him pose in front of that ant hill. Mm-hmm. And I'm, cause I'm like, you know, that was like kind of a strange kind of pose. And it's like, and that ant hill, I mean, I mean, I'm guessing, yeah. and Ken, you can probably tell me, I mean, they look like to be about at least, at least six foot tall. Well, I know that when Mike and I, and I don't know if Michael knows this, but when we did the uh, Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates in 2022, we went down to Brazil. We actually went and found the farm that that photo was taken on. And we went out into, in, into the field because Breezy, Fred Breezy, the one who took it, described you know the field and all these anthills that were out there. And truly, there were thousands of them. But we came up on where we believe that photo was pretty much taken. And there were anthills out there, Mike, what would you say? Maybe three foot tall, maybe maybe anywhere between three and four feet tall. Some of them were actually taller than that, but I'd say the majority of them maybe between three and four feet tall. Yeah. And then and, and they're similarly shaped, they're sort of cone shaped the way that mm-hmm. they're the, huh. they're designed by the <clears throat> I think it's termites, not ants. Oh, it's, it's termites, you're right. Yeah. I say ants, but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So three feet, three feet tall, and how tall were your your uncles? Oh, try to, to <laughs> now you well, challenging me. Five ten. The other one was five. I think Clarence was five ten. I think John was five eleven. I think yeah, John Clarence was, was just a little bit taller. Yeah, than five ten, five eleven. Yeah, yeah. But that's well, in the FBI I mean, report. We have a um, passport photo that we think could potentially be John, right, Mike? Do you remember? Well, yeah, there was the, the the John Anglin photo that was that was taken in Brazil. Right. Yeah, that photo of in that passport. But I'm curious, would you be able to do? Oh, I mean, it's such a small photograph. Ken, you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. It's very small, but I don't know. Would that inhibit your analysis because of the size of the photo, or would you be able to do something with you that? Scale it up. Yeah, I have, have to scale it up. And again, you, when you're talking about AI. Um, you know, there are programs up there where you can scale up a photo like that and not lose any detail or distortion. So it's something that could certainly be done. I'm really curious, though. I mean, it, it, you keep talking about these photos, and and is there still some doubt amongst law enforcement that, that because I understand, I understand I'll, I'll let that, Ken answer that question. We actually well, had art on the podcast. Yeah, so you know, so right after the show. When we were filming, and the very first time I ever showed that photo to Art, Art, yeah, literally, it was, I mean, people will think, well, it was made up in the show, but it, re- it really was genuine. I handed him that photo, and I could see it in his eyes. His eyes just, like, went wild. And they took him off and talked to him, and he was like, his brain was spinning, you know, 90 miles an hour. He, he just, he could see it. And so he pretty much really believed it. And um, when we went and we met with uh, Michael Geitz, who was the acting U.S. Marshal on the case at the time, he, um, he thought, okay, yeah, I can, I can see it. But then later on, he came out and tried to discredit the photo. And that's the reason why I asked you about measure, because he came out and did a TV interview and said, he looked at the photo and he compared it with another photo of Clarence and he took a ruler and he measured their arm length 
and he it came up different. And so, in his opinion, that was a that was not Clarence and John. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, that's not you're not even a professionally trained person to look at a photo and you're discrediting it right now. Well, too long after that, Art then started kind of saying, well, we're not sure it's them and uh, there's no definite proof. And I'm like, well, of course. But then when we showed him, you know, IDENT TV, they came back with a 99.7% match with John. He, he still pretty much is standing by Michael Dykes and saying that um, they don't believe the photo was, was, was them. So, you know, even Michael Dykes came back and said he thought that it was taken in Brazil. He, he won't discredit that. But he believes that that's one of the other England brothers that were down there. And that's uh, that's actually Uncle Man is what he said. <laughs> Doesn't even look like going, well, what in the heck would Uncle Man, my uncle, be down in Brazil? <laughs> no. Every that's time that's he came and said something, it didn't even make sense. And it doesn't even look like Uncle but Man. But also, the lenses, I mean, we've been working with cameras for over 25 years. There's no way that you'd be able to take a ruler and make yeah. that distinction. Well, that's the reason why I, I mean, want to hear photo, that's ridiculous. As a professional person say that. Because to me, it is ridiculous that he would come up and say that kind of stuff. And when I mentioned it to Art, Art even told me, he said, yeah, you can do that. And I was like, no, Art, I don't think you can. He was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can do that. I was like, no. <laughs> so well, I'm just glad that you backed up what I've been trying case, to say. <laughs> if that's the case, they wouldn't have a measurement thing behind on the wall when they take mug shots. You know, well, like, and I kept you know, saying, you know, today. That's why they do it. In today's cause... technology, the FBI is not at an airport watching this terrorist walk through the door, and they're measuring him versus doing facial recognition. That, to me, is the number one tool that, at least I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but that's the number one tool that law enforcement uses today to identify someone. Is, is that not true? Um. For airports and, and different types yep. of uh, secure facilities, yeah, yep. bio, you know, facial biometrics is, is, a, is a big deal. But again, you know, you look at it this way, and this is one thing as a, as a former law enforcement officer that, you know, I, I recognize, you know, uh, that law enforcement is really loath and really difficult to change. It's like trying to, it's like an aircraft carrier trying to make a U-turn in the middle of the ocean. It's, it's very it's a very slow, laborious process. And, and I understand why the FBI and the U.S. Marshals and whoever was involved back when the escape occurred, they had a dog in the fight because they were embarrassed. They didn't want, you know, the, the whole idea, the whole reason they put a prison out on an island in the middle of San Francisco Bay because it was supposed to be escape proof. And, and really, if you look at it, there are a lot of things people can do that people think they can't with determination, proper planning. And I think one of the things that... Uh, Texas Crew Productions did very, very well was they presented the scenario based upon evidence that was found supporting that, that in fact, they, they did make it off the island and they did survive the, the trip across the bay. But they did it in such a way that they presented it to where it was up to the viewer to make their own conclusion. And I'm really disappointed that law enforcement today you know, 60 some years later, agents and officers that don't have a reputation or a dog in the fight, even their own agencies are still loath to admit what appears to be the truth that these guys made it off the island. I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. Now, well, there's a, there's a lot of things. I mean, it's like they're, you know, Ken has gotten a lot of the redacted files through FOIA requests, but there's plenty of others and, we were talking, we had a retired FBI agent on here, and even he said, he goes, at this point, why wouldn't you just release everything? I mean, they're either dead or they're in their 90s, and nothing's going to happen to them anyway, or their families. This is this case is basically uh, closed as far as that, but they, they continually say it's open because there's no resolution for it. And I just find it's very strange why they uh, wouldn't want to know or at least let people know what really happened, regardless if it was a mistake on the government's part and, and short sightedness. I mean, there's, there's so many things about, um, and I don't know, I'd be curious to, you know, uh, hear your ver 
hear what you feel after if you've read their book yet. Their book is because I thought I knew a lot about the Alcatraz escape, but what Ken and Mike have done is they put together really a a, a an amazing piece of you know work where they kind of break down, but they also they illustrate what type of men these Clarence and John were from an early age, coming from uh, a family of fourteen, super poor, and they had to they had to steal things just so they could have toys and food for the family, and that's what got them in trouble. But they were God fearing kids, and they every time they escaped from one of their reform schools or detention centers that were that that they always went home because that's where they wanted to be. So they always found them. But they became escape artists at a, a very early age, and pretty much it either escaped or attempted to escape every place that they were put into. And I think that, you know, when we you talk to law enforcement on the federal level, I think they just they don't want to acknowledge certain things. I mean, when we had we had art on here and he said, you know, do you want to change your opinion? And he says he's pretty much no. He goes, I don't think they made it. And it just and then he goes and then we asked him, did you ever go down and look for them? And and to Brazil. And he goes, well, you know, we had, um, what you call it? Interpol. Interpol. And then, then Ken has documents stating that, uh, from the government stating they believe that they're in Brazil. And it's just like, so it's like, I don't understand the disconnect between the two, uh, things other than if they're just kind of sign this document when they become federal agents that they have to toe the line. Um, but, uh, I just don't, it, it doesn't make sense, especially at this day and age. And the, the amount of data and evidence that both Ken and Mike have produced in this book, I mean, it's, you know, like I said, we always said, we, we, we told our, goes, listen, we're going to get a jury, we'll get a judge, and, you know, you can present your evidence, and all Ken and Michael have to do is just throw the book on uh, at the jury, read the book, and we'll see how it lays out. Um, and, you know, Art just got done reading the book and we're hoping to have him on. So I'd love to hear his thoughts on that. But I just don't understand. I mean, from your perspective as a law enforcement, retired law enforcement, I just don't understand the resistance to data like that. I mean, it's it's like how how can you ignore it other than you're just kind of towing a party line to kind of save face? I, I think that, well, I mean, my... My personal opinion as a retired career law enforcement officer is basically, um, you know, these people, uh, and, and let me throw it out there that, you know, the FBI, the U.S. Marshal's Office, they've done fine work over the years. They're very storied law enforcement agencies with a rich history with, with a bunch of really, really good people working for them. And I would think that this would be an enormous public relations coup, if, if nothing else to really bring this case to a close. But again, you know, I had a boss in the police department one time, a lieutenant, he eventually became chief. And he told me one time, he said, look, we all answer to somebody. And in, in having a father who was the chief of police, while being in his office when he picked up the phone, one phone call moved heaven and earth. Um, we all answer to somebody and, and maybe the buck doesn't stop with the U S marshal himself. Maybe it goes higher than that. I don't know. I'm not into conspiracy theories, but I can't understand why there's reluctance because again, cases is, is so old. Wouldn't you want to get it off the books? Wouldn't you want to be known as the organization that really finally solved this thing instead of making you guys go to, create a GoFundMe account to hire a private investigator to finally crack the case and, and find the bodies or find them in an old folks home in Brazil or something. Yeah. I mean, it's like we have enough information to really kind of at least verify and go down there and hopefully, you know, possibly find a grave site. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what that would look like in another country being able to exhume a body to just do a DNA test. But that, well, we that, could do that, a that DNA would, test on their kids. Yeah, that too. Mm -hmm. That's the other oh. thing. That's the other thing. We have like documents kind of um, basic. It's in layout with what we have as far as you've been doing we have like work. a lot of um, documents that are connecting Clarence and John to the children that they allegedly had. So there's a probate letter that was in that area by that farm given to one of the children um, in 2011. And his name is also Clarence. 
<laughs> not many people named Clarence in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not a lot. It, it's, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll have to put the book on on my to read list. But I just I I look at this, and again, just what I saw on the Escape from Alcatraz history program, history channel program, uh, convinced me to, to take a, a, a look at it and say possibly. And and look, I've met a bunch of people who were just street criminals who had no art, had no swagger to their game, so to speak. And then you read about he's people like John and Clarence Anglin that pulled off an amazing escape. Um, you see these, um, I saw um, a program, I think it was a Netflix show or something about the Spider-Man of, of Europe or whatever. This guy was a rooftop burglar, former special forces guy. And, and he had this, um, there was an art to his, his way of stealing. And I, and I didn't like the fact he stole, but I had to admire the guy's game and, and the precision and the discipline and all the work and thought he put into his planning. So as a, as a professional, I had some respect for his game. Uh, did he deserve to be in jail? Certainly. I'd love to sit down with uh, the Anglin brothers, if they're whether they're you know, 90 years old or, or whatever, and then find out how the heck they did it. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to know that? Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, Ken's got a good line uh, to that. You know, in this book, which you'll, which you'll see when you read it, is that you know he got he was able to get a lot of information. He also some of the information she, he got about his uncles was through Whitey Bulger, who he had corresponded with when Whitey was inside prison when they were doing research for this book. So he's got tons of letters and he basically told him a lot of details and how things were done. Cause you know, based upon, and you'll find out when you read the book is that it wasn't just John and Clarence that planned this escape. They had a lot of help. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, it was their master plan, but uh, they they had people behind them that had a, a an interest in seeing them getting out. And so which takes yep. it to a whole nother level when you have that. And and the fact that, you know, one of those people, a notorious gangster, Mickey Cohen, who uh, they had had a relationship prior to being locked up in Alcatraz, who was also locked up in Alcatraz with him somehow was able to get uh, paroled for six months um, by Chief Justice Warren, Supreme Court Justice at the time, <laughs> which has never happened. We have art on, on camera here okay. saying that has never been done before, ever. So there's like, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist either. I mean, I'm about facts and stuff like that. But something's strange there. There's strange uh -oh. why that would happen only for six months. And then literally shortly thereafter when he came back, you know, because John and, and they were only in that that place for like a year and a half, I think, mm -hmm. before they escaped. So, in a, you know, an incredible amount of time, short period of time that they had to plan one of the most amazing escapes from a prison ever. So um, it's just it's hard to believe. And I think that just that that layer there about the Ch Chief Justice Warren and the way the government was working at that time. Um, just leads me to believe there's more to this than meets the eye. And that's probably why, uh, you know, you have art like standing his ground and a lot of other federal agencies, agents who are, who have been experienced with that, that they just don't want this information out for some reason. Exactly. In the same way, they don't want the JFK information out in the same way they're, you know, dragging their heels on the Trump assassination attempt. And now it doesn't, you know, the most storied, law enforcement agencies in the world, they can't figure out how a 20 year old kid got up on a roof and, you know, took eight shots at the uh, a presidential candidate. And everyone's like, Oh, I don't know. It was the local law enforcement. It's their fault. And, and you know, we didn't have the proper radios. Oh, the roof was too, you know, sloped. I mean, it just, it just, it doesn't, you know, I was listening to a, a former CAI contractor, Navy SEAL who uh, has a, a podcast and, his name's Sean Ryan, and he's, you know, he worked for the government his whole life. He's done, like, super high-end, you know, intelligence stuff. He was, you know, he was, did a lot of crazy stuff. And when you hear someone like that who's been inside these organizations where he says, I don't trust any of them. I don't trust what they say. I don't trust what they do. I can't, you know, that's, you know, that to me, that's not conspiracy. That's just someone who has an experience of seeing how the sausage is made on the inside and that, they just keep on passing the buck, keeping in a file, 
bury it somewhere so we don't have to deal with it. Because if no one's talking about it, we don't have to deal with it. And I think that's part of the thing. But for something like this, after all this time, I don't understand why, um, you know, they just don't don't open the floodgates. No, you know, most of the people that are involved that were working at the prison are dead. Yeah. I think it's a, you you know, you see it every day, like at the local law enforcement level, you find out, um, you know, like a, like an officer that that does something that like he beats the the daylights out of somebody and it's caught on camera and he's brutalizing somebody. And and you find out that the person has been fired by three or four law enforcement agencies. It's like, how do you get hired? And when it's on camera for everyone to see law enforcement agency circles their wagons and defends the person and doesn't want to come out and admit, you, you know, we made a bad hire. We corrected the situation by firing this person. They're no longer employed and will never be employed again in law enforcement. But instead, they try to hide it. They turn their back on it. And, and the public's not stupid, you know, and no. I don't believe in necessarily full transparency and accountability because I don't know that everyone can really handle that. But I think they can. I think people know what they see. And I think with most people's value systems, they recognize when people are doing a poor job and need to be removed. And and law enforcement agencies shouldn't stand up there in front of the cameras and, and, and defend and or try to hide from the fact that it happened. They made a mistake. And I think the public would appreciate it if they admitted that they made a mistake. And this is how we corrected it. No different than federal level. You know what? We were wrong. These guys did make it off the island. And guess what? We've solved the case. And, you know, people exactly. would have so much appreciation exactly. for that. Exactly. Exactly. That's all we're looking for. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's That's coming all the family in, in a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I tell you, it's just a strange, strange world. And, you know, when I first started in law enforcement, we didn't have all these incredible tools. We didn't have drones. We didn't have facial recognition. We didn't. I mean, I started, I carried a radio the size of a brick. I had a few bullets on my gun and I carried a police baton and that's it. And now you see the full on raid vest with tasers, with this and that and a hundred different radios. And there's so much technology that it's a great time to be in law enforcement. But yet at the same time, we actually had to hide. We actually had to, you know, we had less tools, but yet we got the job done. I was, I was telling my wife one time, I said a lot of the, some of my most successful arrests of bad people were hiding out from the police. We're in these CD hotels or these big hotels. And I always used to go hide by the ice machine, and the vending machine, because I knew they would very rarely leave to go out and eat somewhere they could be seen, but they'd come out and eat from the vending machines. So imagine, you know, just little tricks like that. And nowadays they don't have to do it because they've got so many detection tools and stuff to know where these people are otherwise. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Great well, time to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on. We Thanks would love to. Me. We would love to show you the photo that we're talking about at some point in the future. Yeah, but, for, by all means. Yeah, just reach out. I'm always available. Thank you. So Fantastic. nice to meet you. Take Thanks care. again. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Good luck, Ken and Mike, with uh, your investigation. Rob thank and you. Cindy, you guys are doing a great job shining a light on this. I, I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of it. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much.